Okay, I'd like to call this work session and final markup for the final fit or for the fiscal year 2025 budget of the Prince William County School Board to order. Thank you. We will begin tonight's work session and final markup with opening remarks from Superintendent Dr. McDade, followed by updates from Shaquille Youssef, our Chief Financial Officer. And then I will share the ground rules for markup and we'll open the meeting up to board members for discussion. Following tonight, the board will vote to approve the final budget for fiscal year 2025 at next week's meeting on March 20th. At this time, I'll turn things over to Dr. McDade. Thank you so much, Dr. Latif. Uh, welcome all to our work session for the final markup of fiscal year 2025. The budget team and school division leadership work together to de develop this budget, which continues to support our vision 2025 launching thriving future strategic plan. On February 7th, our team submitted the fiscal year 25 proposed budget to the school board. The school board then held a public meeting on the proposed budget on February 12th and then a public hearing on February 21st. Tonight, we are here to conduct a work session for the final markup of fiscal year 25 budget. On March 20th, the school board will consider approval of the fiscal year 25 budget and capital improvement program, which will then be submitted to the Board of County Supervisors for their consideration later this spring. I want to thank um, each of our school board members for your engagement, your thoughtful feedback and suggestions throughout the budget season. I also look forward to partnering with our school board as we collaborate to ensure a budget that best addresses our students' needs. A couple of things I want to reiterate that I think is important, not just for our discussion tonight, but also for our public. I want to reiterate that this budget reflects specific strategic investments in certain areas as our students' needs have shifted. So where you'll see in certain areas of the budget where it may look like a significant increase, I want to remind everyone specifically that what we're seeing is an overall increase in the percentage of students who are English learners. As to date, 25% of our student population are identified as English learners. So where we have increased needs um, as we continue to grow in our uh, student population for English learners, you'll see that reflected in increases in the budget. Our percentage of students that are economically disadvantaged, as determined by federal criteria, has reached approximately 42%, and our students with disabilities have increased by approximately 10.7% over the last five years. And when we look at how uh, funds are allocated, the higher need students also have a higher per pupil dollar amount, and that's reflected in different um, both school and department budgets where you may see some significant increases. Given the significant growth in the student populations that I've highlighted, the cost per pupil to educate students with higher needs has increased, and this impact how we allocate funds and consider resourcing our schools uh, and our division offices that support schools. So what's being proposed in terms of additional markups are directly driven from um, strategic priorities as well as feedback from our school board members and our constituents through various opportunities um, in public comment. And so you'll see some of that reflected in what we're going to propose here in, uh, in markup. So at this time, I would like to welcome our Chief Financial Officer, Shaquille Youssef, and he's going to provide an update on the proposed budget for fiscal year 25. Also, our Chief Operating Officer, Vernon Bach, is going to provide an update on the Capital Improvements Project. Shaquille. Thank you, Dr. McDade. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Latif, school board mem members. I have a short presentation here on what has transpired since um, we last met and proposed the budget in, in February. Um, before I start, I would like to introduce uh, the members of my budget team sitting in the back there, Natasha Valencia, uh, Kathleen Addison, and Joe Mondoro. Let's do this. So in terms of county revenue, we, the BO, BOCS is meeting on March 19th to, to receive a revenue update. Uh, the tax rates that they advertised uh, is the same from the previous year at 96 cents, 90, 0.966 for real property. Um, the real property taxes may come down depending on how the county uh, votes and, and, and what their bu budget process is. They did add a $3.70 advertisement for computer and peripheral taxes, which is the highest rate possible. So the county revenues, we, we plan to re uh, keep the same, but it is pending finalization of tax uh, rates from, from, from the BOCS. 
The next um, item is state revenues. I'm sure a lot of you have received updates and followed where state revenues are. The General Assembly on March 9th approved uh, the budget, the governor's proposed budget. Uh, they approved the budget with uh, additional K-12 resources, primarily dedicated towards um, a compensation supplement for 3%. They had, uh, they reintroduced the hold harmless grocery tax uh, supplement. Uh, they also introduced um, L tiered staffing ratios, which present a challenge in implementation given our current hiring environment, plus in terms of looking at how we are going to staff this. In addition, one of the things we do not have right now is the BDOE state revenue calculation template. Now this is considered for us the gold standard in from which we are able to take the state, the state budget numbers and, and provide it in terms of what it means for PWCS. Uh, we're still waiting for that to happen. I'm not sure where the uh, disposition of this budget will go. I've, uh, we've heard, we really haven't heard anything concrete from our folks in Richmond other than there may be a line item veto by the governor. Um, so we really, at this point, do not have any other information. So our current estimates are still at the levels held by the governor's budget, pending the governor's a a action on the budget. The next two slides, I'm not gonna go into detail. I, I really cannot do a good version of Donna Eagle, she presented this, but this is just uh, the slide carried over from when we proposed, which talks about the different uh, groups we have and the percentage increases that we are proposing for each of the groups. And the next slide talks about average salary increases over the years, since 2021. We've gone from 2.8, 5%, 7%, 5%, and a range of 5.2 to 6.1% in the 2025 budget. The next slide is the markup additional investments and I'm going to hand it over back to Dr. McDade. Thank you so much, Mr. Youssef. So following uh, the first presentation to the board of the proposed budget, um, we've since then had a significant amount of input and feedback from the board as well as we've heard public comment on the budget and as a result of that you'll see some additional investments that are being proposed tonight um, that is in direct response to the feedback that we receive and I do want to thank the board for your proactive involvement in the many conversations that we've had to really push thinking around how we can maximize every dollar for the benefit of our students so I do want to go through each of these um, and specifically give a short summary of where we are the first one is the opportunity to provide student telehealth services for all students, and we will need to allocate one um, FTE to oversee all of that and manage that. The total cost for programming for it in, in addition to the FTE is 1.5 million because it would cover uh, all uh, 90,000 plus um, students who would want to take advantage of this. And do want to note that student telehealth is being used um, in other school systems uh, within Virginia and there's, um, it follows all of the compliance and regulations and there's protection for um, you know, student protected information as well. All of those things are considered in this. The second one is the, uh, an additional assistant STEM and robotics coordin coordinator, which is a, a really dire need. We are growing in leaps and bounds in our robotics programming. Um, and so we're adding $165,000 to the budget to cover the need for the assistant uh, robotics coordinator. The third investment that we're proposing as an addition is um, software, and this is to support the FOIA office to make sure that we are in compliance, uh, legal compliance with records, um, document review, retention, and preservation and production. Um, FOIA demands have increased significantly, um, and it is outpacing uh, the actual bandwidth that we have within the office. So this is a $150,000 investment to make sure that we're making good on our commitments and legal requirements for FOIA. The, the fourth item is an additional uh, staff member, support staff member in the school board office. 
to achieve a more effective one to two support ratio for each board member. That's $108,640. Uh, $108, Keeping in mind that you know what we give here can be um, wages, salaries, and benefits. Additional funding for the communications department. This is a $25,000 investment to support marketing for specialty programs, particularly specialty programs that may be struggling and need an additional boost in support in marketing. Um, and then we're also adding a human trafficking specialist, um, and that is $111,000. We are also, just as a reminder, um, we are required to implement the Virginia Literacy Act in full force beginning next year. We right now only have one language arts supervisor, and, the, and they represent K-12. And the lift for um, VLA and Science of Reading implementation uh, will require a, a focus on K-8, a focused person dedicated for K-8. We really need someone K-8, 6, 8, and then 9, 12 instead of one person, 9, 12. And so we're at least proposing this year to add one at minimum to address the needs of, for K-8. And then we have additional administrative interns for middle school and high schools. This was something that I did, um, you know, bring forward to the board as a concern after getting, you know, reports and feedback from our school administrators around uh, some of the burdens, the administrative burdens that exist, especially in schools where, you know, there are higher percentage of students with, um, with needs that require additional attention from administration. So this will go a long way in supporting our schools, and that's all of our middle schools and high schools. We also are responding directly to feedback around the compensation package. Um, so we initially proposed a lift for teachers 12 through 18. We're gonna expand that from 12 to 18 to 12 to 20 years. Um, and then we're also going to lift the experience cap for years of teaching experience to 25 years. Now, both of these together, the first one increasing the lift is gonna be to the tune of about $2.1 million. And then raising the cap is $1.3 million. And at this time, I do want to invite um, Donna e Dr. Donna Eagle to just give us a brief, o brief overview of what this really means for our workforce. Thank you, Vern. <clears throat> so good evening. Um, in terms of the expansion of the cap from 12 to 18, or the lift, excuse me, from 12 to 18 years to 12 to 20 years, um, you know, we compare our salary scales to um, counties that are contiguous to us as well as Manassas City and Manassas Park School Divisions. Our primary competitors for our salaries are Fairfax and Loudoun because their hiring requirements are similar to ours. So those are the primary counties and also they're the most competitive as compared to us. And so when we're comparing our salaries, we do keep a very close eye on our teacher scale as compared to their teacher scale by years of experience. And based on these comparisons, you know, when we started this work, when we established a compensation unit in the, in the division, in the HR department in um, FY20, we realized that we were lagging the market in several areas throughout the scale. In some areas, the lag is larger than others as compared to <coughs> Loudoun and Fairfax. And as a result, as resources have become available, over the past several budget years, the school board has funded differentiated compensation for teachers with various experience levels. Um, and it, just to kind of give you the history lesson as a reminder, uh, in FY23, we allocated an additional $12 million over and above um, the division um, raise for teachers with one to four years of experience that received an, the equivalent of another step and also teachers from five to 20 years experience that who would now have seven to 22 years of experience. Um, they received a total of between 10.1 and 11.11% increase in raises. And then in FY20, <coughs> Um, four, we put another, this current school year, we put another six million um, because we're continuing to close these gaps. Um, and we allocated a, an additional step to teachers from six to 15 years of experience, which would now have seven to 16 years of experience. And those teachers received an average of 8%. And in our proposed budget, as Dr. McDay covered um, in the initial proposal, 
Um, we did have uh, where our teachers with 12 to 18 years of experience would receive an additional step, which is 3% over and above the division average, um, so which that would yield raises from 8 to 9%. Um, and as she stated in this markup, we're uh, recommending that we expand that lift to include teachers completing 12 to 20 years of experience at a cost of a little over 2.1 million. And the lag from, for teachers from 18 to 20 years of experience is the next priority in terms of ensuring competitive salaries. As I think you're all aware, based on the information that you have been provided, as we move up in years of teaching experience, our scales become much more competitive eventually surpassing the salaries offered by our competitors. In fact, PWCS continues to offer step increases after a teacher reaches 30 years of experience, whereas Fairfax and Loudoun do not. <coughs> and should additional funding become available, the next priority area in our scale would be for teachers from 21 to 25 years of experience. Um, but at this point in time, we are recommending an expansion based on the funding that we know we have to extend the lift from, for teachers from completing 12 to 20 years experience as of June 30th, 2024. In regards to the experience um, cap, you know, this is for new hires to the division who um, have previous experience. And historically, these experience caps have been used as a cost control measure to prevent extremely experienced teachers from seeking employment in the final few years of their teaching careers. And so over the years, um, you know, we have continued to increase this cap, the experience cap, as the labor market has become tighter and tighter uh, in order to attract teachers with, you know, experience to the division. <clears throat> and the superintendent's recommended budget, what was initially proposed, was to lift it another year, so to take it up to 23 years. So what that means, if a teacher comes to the division, for instance, with 28 years of experience, they would be placed on the same spot on the scale where a PWCS teacher with 23 years of experience is placed. So it's, it's called an experience cap. So what we're recommending in markup is to move the experience cap um, from 23 years to 25 years. And this move does allow us to better compete for talent. Um, in addition, any teacher who has been previously capped here at PWCS will be moved to the appropriate step for their years of experience. Up to st and so those teachers, <clears throat> you know, currently a PWCS teacher going into FY25 who has 25 years of experience is placed at step 19. So this would allow those 262 previously capped teachers who have between 23 and 25 years of experience to move to the appropriate step relative to their years of experience. So it allows us a better compete for talent and it also rewards our previously capped veteran teachers that are in the division be between, that have between 23 and 25 years of experience to actually move up uh, a step or two depending on how much experience in addition to the step movement that they would have received and the increase that they would have received as part of the base budget. Thank you, Dr. Eagle. And just to reiterate um, and double down on our commitment, we knew that you know we couldn't do everything in, in one fell swoop uh, when it comes to compensation because there's a lot of work that has to be done to get us to the place where you know we are on par and we have parity with other school systems as it relates to, to compensation. So what we've done is incremental changes and investments over the years, which was something that we have outlined in the strategic plan that we were committing to investing in competitive wages. Um, and so we've done that. So if we do get Get additional dollars, um, you should expect that we would be targeting that next group that uh, Dr. Eagle just described that we knew already um, we needed to target. So, but we started with the 12 to 18 based on the, the dollars we had, and that was where the biggest lag was. But we knew the next um, group had to be going up to 25. So, Additional funding would allow us to, to move more aggressively into addressing some of the areas that we already knew existed and was a part of the plan, but was a phased approach year over year. Great. Thank you, Dr. McDade. 
<clears throat> it is important to note that the board members have previously had the opportunity to share with the superintendent any additions or revisions to the proposed fiscal year 25 budget, and those have already been taken into consideration. We will begin by going around the table to each board member for an opening comments. Um, and then following the brief opening comments, we'll then follow this process where each board member in turn will have the opportunity to present any proposed changes they may have um, uh, that they have not previously shared with the superintendent. If there's a change, each change must be moved and seconded, followed by a discussion and a vote. And a vote. No board member may speak twice about a budget change unless until all board members have spoken once about it. After all board members comment is complete the matter will be called upon for a vote by the chair a change may be offered and voted on once there uh, should there be any changes there will be compiled and a final vote on the budget with all changes incorporated will be taken likewise should there be no changes to the proposed budget a final vote will be taken to accept the budget as presented board members are not so bound by otherwise but otherwise pledge to each other not to offer amendments to the budget in open session as being duplicative of the work session efforts, allowing for a straight up or down vote on the budget that is reflected in the final vote of the work session. Board members may make any comments or discuss changes offered in the work session in open session um, at the budget meeting. Okay, we will now move on to opening comments. And then following open comments, board members will have the opportunity to present any proposed changes. Um, would you like to start, Mr. Wilk? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Executive Cabinet and staff that are here tonight. I know this is the most exciting things for you, um, but we appreciate your time and obviously the hard work and diligence that went into uh, formulating and composing this uh, budget. Um, I think, you know, I always say this, especially kind of post-pandemic, uh, you know, in the past, I think one of the big things for me is with uh, previous administration was trying to connect the dots. It felt at times that things were just put into the budget for nice to haves, but it didn't really align with what was ultimately the strategic plan. At that time, I probably couldn't even tell you what the full strategic plan of that was. I do know we were promoting a world-class institution, but the core components of what we offer is a big reason why I'm not what people might have saw in the past of someone who was literally breaking down and cutting things or trying to cut things galore out of a budget. Uh, those days are done, but largely because when these budgets are presented, well, first of all, they hear our feedback, uh, but this budget is aligned to our core values of equity, inclusivity, innovation, integrity, resiliency, and well-being. And it goes along with the strategic commitments of learning and achievement for all, which we see with the academic support, obviously the support and the raises for our teachers, positive climate and culture that goes even to facilities and renovations and programs, family community engagement. Um, one thing I, you know, I wanna highlight that was, uh, I'm appreciative of is uh, the additional funding uh, to promote uh, specialty programs. You know, a hot topic has been, uh, last couple uh, weeks has been uh, the underutilization of some of our buildings. And so for me, something like this is really important to me uh, when I have one of my buildings that is under capacity uh, that I believe has great uh, specialty programs. But in my experience, there's been a disconnect with the community and understanding like what the Cambridge program is. Um, because back in the day, apparently, the credits didn't transfer as seamlessly as AP credits to college. Those days are done. So I think we have to dispel that, I think, and do our best, especially targeting uh, those uh, buildings like uh, a Freedom or a Potomac, a Garfield, that are under capacity. Uh, organizational co uh, coherence, I think, again, you know, we've seen with the CIP uh, and the structure. You know, in the past, I felt like a lot of, you know, the central office hirees were people who were strictly based in a central office position. But what we've done is expanded, and all those, those, those positions might be categorized as central office, the majority of those people are school-based. They're just not kind of in one school. Uh, they don't have one real location in a hub, therefore they're uh, categorized or classified as uh, central office employees. Ultimately, in the end, our goal, I always look at it as our, our output, which we saw a couple weeks ago, with our student vision profile reports is to produce students who are critical thinkers, digital citizens, innovative, visionary, resilient, and global collaborators. That is our ultimate goal. And in this budget, 
I feel like we have met those goals. You know, a big area of mine that was a focus this year um, is, you know, I've always been passionate about the arts, and I know Dr. Latif has um, expounded over the CAPIs and having participation and stuff like that. And a lot of it's not necessarily funding. You know, it is, you know, yes, I did make some requests and things, but once I understood that it's more of a facilities issue, we got to kind of figure out the layout of buildings. You know, one big focus of mine is, you know, what we've seen with the pandemic, post-pandemic, there was an immediate decline in enrollment in like our choirs, our orchestra, our theater and performing arts. Uh, I wanna look into that more. I wanna make sure that our counselors, both at the middle and high school, are definitely promoting those as much as the specialty programs because I think they can be in conjunction with one another and we don't necessarily want kids dropping choir or orchestra because they feel like that's the only period that they have to take like an IT class uh, in one of our things. So we, we gotta figure out that process. Um, I wanna make sure we figure out, you know, when it comes to performing arts and really everyone uses those stages, um, you know, in our schools our high schools you know um, I understand that every building cannot be a Colgan obviously it's one of our newest buildings and newest facilities uh, but what can we do to further help our arts programs in some of our older high schools uh, if we can't make space uh, for them to house like props and sets why don't we get rear projectors or something where it can be more digital and it can appear like a set whereas you can't store them in normal situations. I'm very happy with the stipends. Um, I think that's very good. Um, one area that I know the administration is looking at is the strings um, and looking and seeing um, with their team. I'd like to see them get that stipend, but I also understand there's logistical work that has to be done with that um, before anything happens like that with the vote. Um, so that's enough of me rambling. That uh, is my overall feedback and uh, I reserve whatever time is left. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wilk. Ms. Tredenick. I don't think you had any time left. Um, thank you, this is my first budget season with the school board, so I am um, learning and studying and going through the budget. Um, I appreciate the chart clearly labeled um, with all of the additions. I know in my district the robotics position was um, something huge, so I think that that's, or the funding for that, so I think that that's great. I also, um, I know that, that that will be appreciated across the, across the county. Uh, the other position that I liked in this chart was that human trafficking specialist. I think that's much needed um, in the year that we're in right now. And uh, the other thing that I appreciated also is the additional administrative interns. I know that that was a huge topic with, uh, amongst our schools. And of course, the teacher, the teacher jump in pay, that's great, and I appreciate that we're still trying to further increase that jump. Um, and so I hope that our teachers are excited about that, that little effort that we made, even though that's a big effort, it's a big leap. So thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, and I think that's it, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adenick. Mr. Blake. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't have much to say. I'm, I'm very happy with this budget. It aligns with our uh, strategic plan. Uh, and that's it, thank you. Mr. Jesse. I'm gonna uh, read through my statement. Some of these are sort of questions that I'm not expecting an answer to tonight, but uh, uh, it's, it's something that I think we should discuss. So the first thing is, uh, when did the staff recommend for significant delays to Brentsville High School, for example, for the renovation, and the 14th High School uh, for the construction moving back? In Prince William County afternoon response, I got some answers. Uh, the question was the declining enrollment of the UVA article that first, or the UVA article that first triggered the need to delay projects. So where did that or who provided the UVA article upon which the staff began to determine if it was necessary to postpone all of these projects? Dr. McDade, I'd like to ask, did you or your staff decide to overrule the previous board? Last year board said this is what you're gonna do. And this year, during mid-year, it, it appears that that was overruled. Or did you, uh, did you have a discussion with any board members before your staff began to overrule the last board? 
regardless of whether this was done with or without the knowledge of the a board member, there are two points I'd like to point out. Once last year board approved a project, I don't think that neither your staff nor a single board member, including the chair, has the authority to stop or delay the process on an approved project. Dr. Latif, as you did today, did you send the first UVR article to all the board members and encourage us to, to consider that? The other thing is then, when is it important, because I find it's hard to believe that with all the adjustments needed to make the, the budget, these changes were being considered and created by a staff not in November or December 2023, but probably last summer or early fall. No one has the authority, in my opinion, to stop a project approved and started by last year's, uh, by last year board. Casual two-on-two -two discussions are not a form formal vote to amend the project. This includes planning, drafting, RSP, et cetera. The who is essential because any stoppage of work on an approved project by previous boards need the board approval. I cannot believe the staff moved forward with all these significant delays without discussing this with you, Dr. Latif. Dr. Latif, wasn't one of your campaign, campaign pledges to build more schools to relieve overcrowding. Now we are delaying those schools. Did you decide work should stop and wait until 2024 before the full impact of the delays were presented to the new board? At this last board meeting, I said that data presented to the board was a bunch of, here's what I meant. When you show trailers but not rovers, you are not providing a comprehensive analysis to the board. You are not acknowledging the loss of time that the rovers and the teachers assigned to the rooms lose when one leaves and the other one has to set up. You are not acknowledging students of rovers have a more challenging time meeting with their teachers, either one of them, the one that's left the room or the one that's in the room. When you present us with the data you have declared will be placed by the, the you, you, in your presentation in the CIP, your data, uh, you say, w for the program capacity will be done in 2024. You know the data that you're using does not accurately reflect the capacity of a school. Yet, you list schools that are under or over capacity based on that data and declare that they are over or under capacity and some board members last week used that data to say that they are under capacity or not. Based on May 20th, May 20, 2017 planning capacity and program capacity presentation, generally documents that the older the school, the more likely the number of students that are overcrowded increases. Regardless of whether a school is over or under capacity, when the fire marshal posts that a maximum seating capacity of a class is 30, but some periods have 35, the teacher will do the work, have the class, but really we are asking them to break a, a law. When you don't have the needed classroom, you are overcrowded regardless of the number of students. The, and 19 rover, 19 rovers at uh, Woodbridge High School is a prime example. Irrespective of what classroom are used, they are needed by that school. There are significant developments that are planned for our area around this new school. And I say significant. It's not just a small uh, amount. And so on one hand, I understand your study about kindergartens, but the, the development for the Prince William County does not seem to uh, equate with what is happening. No one has been able to tell me when Woodbridge High School has not been overcrowded. The school is 50 years old and everyone I talked to, everyone said it has always been overcrowded. 
Yet any possible relief other than the 14th high school has not been provided. Based on last year's board, the earliest they would get any relief was two years and eight months from now. But now, we are recommending it would be four years and eight months from now. A whole class of students will go through Woodbridge High School in an overcrowded situation. Woodbridge High School will do what it always does. It will do what is required and watch as new schools get relief. The growing number of supporters, and I will continue to remind the Occoquan voters what is public, uh, publicly, or I would say, not being done for Woodbridge High School. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you, uh, Chairman Latif. I appreciate it. I just want to, um, sorry, I was trying to read when something happened. Um, I want to thank the, t the staff and uh, Dr. McDade for preparing a very comprehensive budget that aligned uh, with our adopted strategic plan. Um, wasn't going to go into this, but I think at this juncture it's wise that we may want to, as a board that um, has new members, take it upon ourselves really to look back at some of the historical things that have gotten us to where we are. Um, Justin brought up the old strategic plan. It was like a sheet of paper. There, there wasn't a lot of bullet points. And, and so we have moved into a new chapter of this division and operation, and we should take our time and our due diligence to learn where we were. But we also need to respect where we are and where we're going and use that as the light post to make our decisions, along with taking into account some historical information. Um, I personally am very appreciative of the additions that were brought up this evening. Um, for example, the STEM and robotics coordinator, that's something that I personally have been asking for for years. Um, I am so proud of the fact that our division is one of the only in the country that now has air, land, and sea robotics. It is the skills that our students learn and um, gain knowledge of participating in robotics, we know are some of the number one soft skills that all major corporations are looking for when hiring people. I hear often the chatter about sports versus that versus this. Yes, it's a team effort, but we hear right out of the corporations directly. We hear directly from them. If you can't work on a team, if you don't know how to fail, we don't want you. We don't care you're a straight A student. And so I'm glad to see that uh, we are valuing that and we are giving, um, I know it's just Ms. Carroll, so I can say Ms. Carroll, some additional support in her office. Uh, I just want to take a moment to give her a shout out for sticking with us and coming back to us and really um, bringing other faculty into the fold to continue to develop our programming needs for students. Um, I've always been a big robotic fan, so clearly I'm biased in that situation, but it's not just me. We are being told by our business partners that this is the right direction to go in. So I really appreciate the additional funding for that. Um, obviously our FOIA office, we are a FOIA office of one. Um, there is technology and software out there, so I think that it's wonderful that we are utilizing that. Um, the school board office member, I have had some very lively conversations with the current board members and board members in the past about the need to support our um, wonderful uh, clerk and deputy clerk. I think people highly undervalue administrators at all levels. We are, and I'm gonna say we, cause I've been one for over two decades, the backbones of what makes the executives run and offices run. And if you don't know, um, as the saying goes, you better ask somebody cause you won't have anything typed up, any reports made, any appointments made, any anythings. So um, as this school board continues to grow and modernize, we do need additional help and support for us to be able to function, to do our job. Um, so I am greatly appreciative of that, and I hope that our board as a whole agrees with us. Um, the communications department, I, I give them a standing ovation. Um, just watching all of the new areas that they are advertising, not only for employment, but also helping us change the reputation of some of our schools. Um, Mr. Wilk, you brought up Freedom and um, some of the older schools that have a, a, a reputation problem in the community. Right? We, how many people I spoke to during the election season that did not 
even know that Freedom had won two national awards and had only really seen what they read on Google, which wasn't even accurate because most of those incidences didn't even occur in the school or on the school. It occurred around the school. So taking time out to rebrand our division, to give those schools that suffer from reputational um, injury, depending on who you talk to, a chance to really thrive and flourish and help our community members understand what is going on in our community schools right now and not what was, I think not only is a benefit to those in the building, but also our community at large, because we know that people move for schools. We're the largest employer in this county, and if you don't have good schools, you're not gonna have a good county budget. None of us will be here, and it, you know, we might as well end this discussion. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate the technology that's being utilized by our communication department and the new avenues um, that they are taking to really spread the word, reaching people where they are. Because um, we are a, a county that does not have a centralized communication system. We don't have a newspaper. We don't have anything that really um, binds us together as a community throughout um, from one end to the other of Prince William County. Uh, the additional support for human trafficking I think is wonderful. I would love for us as a board to be updated at a later date about what we're doing programmatically wise, but that's not, not right now, it's not the time or the, the place to do that. Um, the continual investment in providing administrative support at our middle and high schools as they continue to grow and the needs um, of our student population and our staff changes, I think that'll be very instrumental. Um, I. I do appreciate the upper, the nod to the more experienced teachers. That has been something that I feel that they have been left out of the conversation. So I'm glad to see that we are acknowledging that and trying to do what we can uh, within our budgetary constraints. As we move forward, not only I think we should be looking at the upper end of the scale, but I would also like for us to revisit the bottom of the scale. $50,000 after coming out of college is still uh, WIC approved at this point in time. Like we shouldn't have anybody working for us that has to also go seek state benefits. And um, that's the reality of where we're headed. I don't know if we're, we're there now, it's not our fault. Um, but I do think that, you know, when you work for a school division as a full-time employee, you should be able to live somewhere full-time. And I know that's not solely up to us. It's the community that we live in, but uh, um, I think it makes a difference that we continue to do everything that we possibly can to ensure that our employees are well compensated. Um, we, we have not talked um, in this update about the CIP. Um, I think it is something that from what I'm hearing from our fellow board members that we may want to consider a separate session to really understand how the CIP has developed, um, what our cutoff date is versus when the BOC, uh, BOCS approves projects, the timelines involved in getting um, RFPs, plans, construction, uh, all of those things. Um, I keep hearing out in, in the atmosphere the reason and rationale for some for this decision, specifically Mr. Jesse brought up the 14th high school as being incorrect and being solely based off of a UVA study. Um, I don't I don't feel that's accurate. We've talked about it in our first uh, board and when we did our CIP session initially. Um, some additional reasons were outlined that seem to have been lost in the crowd. I did ask for an additional update. Um, and some more in-depth information to be provided, not only to this board to be reiterated, but also to the public, because we know that the media just picked up on the one study and ran with it as if that was the sole decision, and there should be no reason why any member of the public would think at this point in time that our school administration would base anything on one singular lens. Um, we have not acted that way to date. So I, I would like um, not only the information that's been shared with us, but another avenue for us to have that discussion for educational purposes. Um, we often get a tagline in the press and it's not an accurate reflection of the amount of work or the decisions that go into this process. Having two by twos are to prepare us to do our job and so that we can come to meetings and make decisions and, and be informed and ask questions so we don't hold the public here until 12, 31 o'clock at night. Um, it doesn't mean we can't ask those same questions. I'm happy to do so if that's going to provide more information to the public, but I would like to recommend us having an additional work session maybe on um, CIP and capital improvement projects. I happen to have a love affair with facilities and things of that nature, um, but I, I feel like we've missed the, beat, the mark on that um, and educating our public, and that's part of our responsibility to do so. So I would like to see some further discussion on that. Um, just for our own, under, for the public's understanding and for some of our new board members' understanding as well because it's a very in-depth topic um, and you just can't cover everything all the time when you have new people. So I 
want to reiterate that I appreciate the work that's been done, um, but I, I could use a, uh, a little brush up myself. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the remainder of the work session. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, I just, I'll uh, try to be brief. I want to thank everybody who's worked on the budget and the CIP. I know it's a very heavy lift. There's a lot of data that goes into this, a lot of preparation, a lot of team planning, and who knows what else. I know I don't know all that's in the sauce, but I know the sauce is good, so I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I also want to echo the comments about the strategic plan guiding this process. I think that's one of the things that we do really well. Um, when I look at a new budget or a proposed budget, I can see exactly where this fits with the strategic priorities that we identified. And I think the public appreciates that. Those who are paying attention understand that. Um, and I appreciate it as a board member as I reflect the needs of my community and I also consider the needs of the community of Prince William as a whole. Um, so awesome process. Um, I know the development of the budget starts probably, well, as soon as we pass this budget, we're going to start developing next year's budget. I know it's a year-long process. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and on that topic, um, I know even you know the development of the CIP is also an ongoing project. It is a living document. It is year to it, it's a five year plan, but it it rolls year to year to year. So while something may be in the plan now, it may come out of the plan next year. Something that wasn't in the plan may come into the plan because we are a living, breathing community and things change. So that's something really important to keep in mind with the budget and the CIP. Um, but I do appreciate the additional investments. A number of these things are things that I specifically asked for, um, and I'm really pleased to see them in here. Um, things that as I've been out and about in the community, people have told me or have talked to me about over you know, several years, and I'm pleased that we have the resources to be able to put some of these things in. Not just what's additional, but also what's in the budget. Um, of the highest priority to me is those in investments in learning and achievement for all. Um, but I understand we, you know, we have for strategic investment categories. Um, and so I'm very happy to see you know, a number of these STEM coordinator um, software for FOIA, sport FOIA, e-discovery, that's we need to, we need to relieve, there are ways to do smarter, better, um, and, and more efficient and more accurate. So, um, and not drive people into the ground with doing things the way we've always done them. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I can go on, I just think this is great. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to say in my closing, um, as we consider the budget and the CIP, we remember that we are fiduciary um, holders of the budget um, and the public expects us to make wise decisions and decisions to the best of our ability that will last far into the future. And when decisions are made that are rash or aren't supported by data or the facts on the ground, then there is a consequence later on. And in past years, well, nobody is perfect, you know, we try to do it right, but sometimes there have been mistakes and some of the problems that we're challenged, challenged with today are because of decisions that were made in the past. Um, so as we work on this budget, um, I do um, hope that we will keep in mind wisdom, f fiscal restraint, and adherence to data, the best that we have. And, and on that point, I, do, I did forget I was gonna say this. I know um, it, it is my observation that our folks who work with data and um, all the numbers and try to forecast, do a really good job. I think, um, and, and, when, and when they have noticed that they've been outside of a very small margin of error, they go back and they look and they say, okay, we kind of missed it by a little bit, what happened? And then they adjust. So I really do appreciate the fidelity to good data and good research because that drives all of our decisions. We need to be data driven, and I see that in the division, and I appreciate that, and I'm, I have been all over in this data, so I've, I've been relying on it, as I would as a board member. I'm not the subject matter expert, but I rely on the hardworking staff, and I um, have confidence that the information that we're given is useful and accurate, and we can make decisions based upon it. So I just wanted to say that, um, uh, and I will close with that. Thank you very much. Ms. Ms. Uh, Vice Chair Zargapur. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who worked on this budget, who works with the numbers, with the, the CIP, with, the, with the, how many students and, and what we're doing. I know that's a, um, an ongoing iterative process, which is one of my favorite things about bringing you here, Dr. Uh, Dr. McDade. Um, 
the strategic plan absolutely drives everything we do, and I'm grateful that not only do, does it drive our work, but it drives our um, evaluation of our work. I love that you're never afraid to tell us and the public where we are, where we've fallen short, where we need to go, and how we need to get there. And I am, I'm proud to do that work with you, so I, I'm grateful for all of that. Um, I want to specifically thank you uh, for putting in the student telehealth services. Um, if you are a parent who has had to deal with mental health with your child in Prince William County, you know how hard it is to get uh, kids on lists, kids to get seen, and I'm hoping that since this has worked in other districts that this is a good way to kind of catch our students before things get super serious. Um, I've, I've been that parent. I've, I've waited for a bed at Dominion that never came. I've sat in emergency rooms with my child. Um, it's not cool. Uh, and we're solidly middle class. I have relatively good insurance. So um, I, I wonder if it had existed when she was in middle school, if it could have caught some of those things that we just were bewildered by, if it would have been a better path for her. So hopefully this provides a better path for some of our kids and gives uh, our parents and families a peace of mind. Um, the other thing I'm gonna just highlight super quick are the, the teachers. Um, thank you so much for continuing to work on the pay scale. I know it's, it's easy to sit and say, well, teachers deserve to be paid more and they work hard. And, and it's so hard when our buckets of money only come from a couple sources and we are reliant on what they give us. And we have to be smart as the decision makers here on how to make that money get into the right places. So I am grateful that we can consider our teachers who were, I know they were feeling a little ignored or not heard, and I'm glad that we're able to do something. And I know we're gonna continue to do things. So um, the, the, the budget has been, um, it's been a pleasure to do this over the past couple of years. I thank you, and uh, Dr. Latif, I'm done. Thank you, Vice Chair Zarapur. All right, um, excellent, um, just brief comments. Again, we'll re reiterate, thank you for all the great work. Um, the budget um, is fantastic. It aligns with the strategic plan. It's another good budget. Again, to remind everyone, final numbers won't really, you know, we'll approve our budget next week, but the county then has to approve theirs. That might change revenues depending on what they do with tax rates and the state budget won't be finalized until the governor signs it, which may or may not happen, and they may go into special sessions on that. I think the high points in this year's budget really align with teaching and learning if you really look at the work we do. And so from the teaching standpoint, it's another significant raise, and I truly appreciate the extra work we're doing to adjust the pay scales in the mid-ranges um, in the uh, now 12 to 20 years. And we still have work to do, as you heard from Dr. McDade, which I think is critical. Um, but th this is something we have continued year over year to really make significant improvements. And I'm very proud of the efforts we've done on that. Um, and it's not easy. You know, I mean, we have, but, you know, we've prioritized salaries because we believe in improving recruitment and retention. And that does work. But, you know, Prioritizing salaries takes money away from other things that we have to do as well. So it, it, is, a, it is a careful balance. Um, and this is, I'd like to remind the public, the 6.1 is on top of the two that went into effect in January. So just at January 1 was a 2% raise, which we rarely ever do a mid-year raise, but the way the state budgets worked out, they provided some late monies and we were able to do that. So this will be two plus 6.1. So it's really 8.1 moving into next year. So that's very exciting. And, and, and if you take a look at the other numbers, they're, they're great. So that's on the teaching side. On the, on, the, on the learning side, we have invested heavily in tutoring. That's in the base budget. We've invested in um, adding, um, you know, there's the science of reading. We're adding some experts for that. We're adding, you know, more instructional coaches. Um, you know, I think, with every budget, you know, and there's been very few budgets that I've been disappointed with really over the last few years, but I could always want more. And I think everyone who looks at the budgets would say, you know, I didn't get everything I wanted. Um, and that happens to me every year. I would love our council ratios to continue to drop. I know the recommended council ratios are 1 to 250. I'd love to see them at 1 to, you know, I'd like to see us beat the national recommendations. So, you know, I have a wish list that's that's really big and, and, and continues to sort of, 
you know, unfortunately be disappointed by just, you know, where, where I think we, we just, as a society, need to pour much more money into education. But with what we have, this has been terrific. I appreciate, Dr. McDade, all the um, added additions to the proposed budget. Um, this is very exciting. And let me, let me reiterate the important part also on the teaching and learning on the learning side, mental health. And we've all talked about how important that is. We, we've heard a lot. We've, the public has come to speak about it. Students have spoken about it. Student board member has spoken about it. It has been something that has been accelerated from the pandemic and a real issue. This um, telehealth um, effort uh, has been successful in other counties across the co Commonwealth and the country. Um, I'm excited about it. I think there is a movement in the state budget um, to help um, there might be more monies coming to us earmarked for telehealth as well, which may help us recover some of the monies we're going to make that investment on. But this investment is going to happen regardless, is my understanding, right? We're going to do this. So this is very exciting. So anyways, that is, um, you know, all I have to add. And, and just to say that, you know, every time we make a vote, we, you know, not everyone gets what we want, not everyone who's out here, you know, um, um, you know, certainly um, we have to make changes and adjust for, for, for the data that we see. So we will now move to the next session of the meeting where each board member in turn will have their opportunity um, to make remarks. And so we will, I'll start by saying, are there any proposed changes um, at this time? We can go either who wants to go first or we can start down with Mr. Wilk if you'd like. Or anybody. Does anyone have, okay, let's, let's first start. Does anyone have any recommended change to the budget? Any motions? Mr. Jesse. Yeah, I'd like to move that the uh, CIP be amended, the proposed CIP be amended to have the 14th high school go back on to the original schedule that was uh, voted on and approved last year. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman, with a disclaimer, please. Sure. Um, out of respect for Mr. Jesse, uh, in that this really ends tonight. This is a work session, the chance to change the markup of the budget. Um, full transparency, I'm not supporting this, uh, but in the effort of allowing him to make his pitch once more, and if any board members choose to speak uh, as to why they're making their decision, I'm gonna open this up. I've heard a lot of people say, well, this is what, you know, the Dr. McDade wants. Well, the reality is she makes a proposal for us and what she believes is in the best interest of our school division. And so I'm not saying everyone has to speak on this, but if people would like to add after he speaks, and I think I get to speak with the second, um, I think this is a good opportunity to have that out because the press is here, people have covered this story, there's a certain narrative, and I think this is a great opportunity for everyone to kind of speak. So we'll call that your disclaimer and your first comment, okay? <laughs> um, who would like to go next on the discussion? So the motion's been seconded, we, we're now open for discussion. Wait, sure, Mr. Jesse. Yeah, first of all, I, I just wanna clarify a couple of things. Uh, it's been sort of on the web that uh, when Mr. Wiggins spoke that he was talking about bullying and people were, uh, some people were saying that was Dr. McDade. That was not Dr. McDade who he was talking about, so I want to make that clear. The second thing uh, is that, as I said before, Woodbridge High School is 50 years old. Uh, my kids didn't go there, we went to Garfield. And as somebody spoke uh, a few minutes ago, the reputation of the school also helped determine whether people want to go there or will do whatever they can to get out of there. And Garfield did not have the greatest reputation when my kids went there, but we still sent them there. And I can say in all honesty that uh, they started the IB program uh, while my two kids were there. My oldest one could not get into the program. And my youngest one, it changed her life. The IB program really worked. So even though it didn't, it was a good school for us. And I want that, but I want the teachers and, and the uh, students, they make things work. 
whatever it is. And this school is not only overcrowded, it's grossly overcrowded. And we need to do something about it. Now, am I t tied to having a 14th high school? No. I want relief for Woodbridge High School. And I would like the staff to figure out something because we shouldn't have to wait five years. To, but as I told people last night, regardless of what we do, it's going to take five years but, uh, to get done. So, but we would need the relief. The number of developments that are scheduled to go around where the school is is high. Over 2,000 people, uh, are apartments and so forth. So that's low. Uh, is, this, is this boggling to my mind that we don't? And yes, it is a living document. But a living document has rules. And we, when we make major decisions in the middle, it deserves a vote. If it, when we moved all these projects back uh, two years, one year, those were major decisions. And that should not be a casual conversation, in my opinion. It should be a conversation and a special meeting called to get that done. We need, to, we need to help and we need to get this done. The teachers, they will do whatever you tell them to. They're not gonna come here to the boardroom. It's not in their best interest to come, but they will get the job done. They will teach your kids, but they deserve, and Woodbridge High School deserve. And I don't know much about Brentsville High School. I just looked at it. It's older than Woodbridge. And it deserved that renovation. And I don't know why we're waiting. So, uh, you know, as Mr. Wilkes said, and, and I appreciate the fact, and I knew he was not supporting the program, but I appreciate his second. Thank you. Ms. Trudenick. Thank you, Mr. Jesse, for explaining that. Um, I, I, again, have been overly clear about the CIP and the and the changes that need to be made and I what I heard you say Mr. Jesse is that Woodbridge High School needs relief um, I, I don't know that relief is brought about with a new school um, I think that we as a board have other options in providing relief for these incoming developments that you're referring to that are happening all across the county um, Prince William County is growing, um, and in different districts more than others, which I explained to you last week, you know, you're talking about 2,000 incoming projects. Um, the Brentsville district has 6,000 homes incoming on, on a piece of paper, um, and, and they're not voted on yet, so they're in the air, which means if they do happen, we're not prepared um, in the next four years. So it's something that we have to look at, which we're, we're having those conversations, we're talking about it, and it's about planning. And I think that when we have the conversation now, it can prepare us for the future to be prepared later on. Um, so I understand where you're coming from needing relief. And a lot of people have said, you know, the redistricting and the, re, and the realigning of, of lines and things like that, that's a conversation. Um, and, and I appreciate your perspective. I appreciate the parents and the teachers and the students that came out and talked about the need. Um, again, we're given numbers, and I do think that you guys have done a great job. You mentioned Brentsville High School, um, and it's no secret that I love that school. Um, and I went there when it was a middle school high school, and it was very overcrowded while we were all walking those hallways together. Um, Brentsville High School has gotten renovations. There are renovations in the CIP for them. It is an old school. There are things that are failing, but they have addressed those items and the other items of need are on the list to be addressed in the order that they're needed. Um, and I trust that if something were to happen sooner, something breaks down, we're gonna fix it. We're not gonna leave it un um, broken. Um, but, but Brentsville has gotten a lot of renovations and it is an old school, but it is a great school. Um, the bones are good there. so. I, 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 see what, I see where you're coming from, I understand what you're saying, but I do think that they're doing a great job addressing all of those needs in the CIP. I do think that there is, is 
more work that can be added into the CIP, more things that can be added in order to, um, to help us further down the road. Um, and I've had those conversations with both Vern and, and Dr. McDade. Um, so thank you. That's all I have. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm going to take the opportunity as the only current elected board member that has spent um, close to a decade on this very topic of overcrowding in schools and land and land utilization and banking and serving on committees and all of the things. Um, I want to say that there is a significant difference from the way that we approached this in the previous administration to how we are doing it in this administration to start with. Um, I also think that, again, I'm going to reiterate what I said during my opening statements, and that is when it comes to facilities and land utilization, there, there's an educational deficit not only among new board members because you just got here, but also within the public. The, the amount of time that it takes to secure land, the process from then each parcel that has to be secured to then developing um, a blueprint, putting those out for requests out for proposals, getting that approved, um, then having the board approve each step along the way. I think that um, it would behoove this board and the public if we had a separate session on just basic understanding of when, when we make these decisions versus when land or developments are approved at the BOCS, what that means to us, what our cutoff date is. All of those things make a difference. And when we do our budget cycle to say, I, I remember, for example, when I first started, I used to get very upset. I was like, well, we know that so-and-so development is getting ready to be approved. I, I'm sure the planning office was not thrilled every time I called because I didn't understand that having a development being proposed but not yet approved, we don't count that because it's not a reality yet. I've also come to learn that just because something is approved does not mean it'll be built right away either. I remember discussions with Maureen Cadigan long, long ago about the type of development that gets approved and the student generation. And we just were updated not that long ago on us utilizing new student generation rates and how we factor students. Um, I think that all of those things make a difference. Somehow the rhetoric has become whether or not we need a high school. I don't think that that's up for debate. I, I think the debate is what I don't even think it's a debate. I, I, from my understanding, what we were asked as a board is, do we want to build a facility that houses 2,000 and some students, or do we want to build a facility that houses 1,000 and some students? We haven't made that decision yet because we haven't had a vote on the CIP. You, you can't continue to do construction if you don't understand, if you don't know what footprint you're going to use. And it would be a waste of our taxpayer dollars to do that. I don't think the argument is whether or not we need another high school type facility. We know we do. I personally am still really upset that I don't have program capacity because I've been asking for that every year for seven years because it's fantastic how many bodies you can put in a building, but it doesn't make any difference if we're not planning to how we, if we're not planning to plan for how we plan to utilize that facility. We need that information. And I think what's missed in this conversation, and it, it, it has been said by this administration, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. McDaniel or anyone from the administration, that we are undertaking a study to look at all of those factors so that we can make well-informed decisions like we are elected to do. I, I've not, I, trust, I, I do not like the idea of delaying a building when I know not only do we need it, a traditional space for our high schools, but we also need another independence, which we haven't even talked about. We have so many students requesting to go there, we have to turn them away. Because at one point in time, again, by reputation, it was a school all the bad kids went to, which I don't even know where that started, to now being a school that students voluntarily go to, we, we have to turn them away because they don't fit a traditional education plan. We have so much work to do and things to think about. I think my understanding of the ask is that we pause and take a minute and utilize for once an administration that's willing to hand us data to back our decisions or to help us make informed decisions, which I think the public has asked for. So I would like to continue down that path. Um, and I think it would do us well to hold a separate work session 
on how we do this process from start to finish and clear up the rhetoric that's out there, clear up the misinformation, allow the public to understand the new changes, the new processes that we have, how we work collaboratively in some regards with the BOCS, because again, I can't emphasize this enough. We are two completely separate entities entirely. But I think the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. When I entered Woodbridge High School in 1990, we had 3,000 students in the school. There were rooms to classrooms just like there are now. There were no trailers. And we still have staff. Dr. Healy, I think, was he was my 10th grade English teacher. So, I mean, I, I understand what it's like to sit in a, in a high school that's overcrowded from a personal perspective. I also understand that this building not only affects Woodbridge High School, it affects Garfield High School. It affects Freedom High School. It has the potential to affect Colgan. It has the potential to affect Hilton High School because whether we like to acknowledge it or not, when a new building goes up, everybody wants to send their kid there because it's new. Even though this administration has made it their absolute priority to ensure that every single school has the same technology and resources available at the division level instead of the school-based level so students don't have to suffer. If you walk into Hilton or Garfield or Brentsville, you have the same technology at each one of those schools. That's a, that's a huge change. So I think... It, you know, if we want before we vote on the budget or whatever the case may be, whether we need to publish something out there or have a separate Saturday session, which nobody ever likes to do, but I'm all here for it, so that we can really inform the public and understand the full picture of what it is that we're trying to do, I think would be a very smart decision. And I'm highly encouraging that we we do that because clearly there's a lot of misunderstanding on how we got to where we are and what it is that we're trying to do. It's been presented as like soul relief for Wibbers, but it doesn't affect. It's a high school. It's not, we're not building an elementary school. We're not building a middle school where it's mostly the effects are within the district. This affects all of us. And I'm, I'm going to actually say the thing that nobody ever wants to talk about, but I've been saying quietly, getting eyeballs of death at me. But if we, if we really believe in equity, we should really look at all the high school boundaries. And yes, please gasp. But it's true. Colgan has more students boundary, within their boundary district than that building can hold. Forget program capacity. What are we going to do when we build another high school and it's right next to th three high schools? We, are we just going to boundary that one again and repeat the same mistake over and over and over again? It, it is painful to wait, but it is even more painful to continue to make the same mistakes without honoring our own commitment with what we said we do, which was value equity, do the best that we can for our students and our staff and our parents. I don't want my child to go to an overcrowded school like I did. But right now, that's what's going to happen in my own family and the community that I live in. It's because my community, Woodbridge District, has more development coming on board sooner. We have a whole other town center in addition to affordable housing coming. And I know for a fact, going back to Maureen Cadigan, when you put in apartments for low, at low cost, even though we were told back then, oh, it doesn't make more people. Young people make people. That's the whole point. So forgive me for the long rampage, but I think it's time while we have the opportunity. This is a brand new board. We're all very intelligent, competent individuals. We have an administration that's dedicated to serving our entire community. We respect the silos through which we were elected, but we embrace equity throughout our division and finally, finally put a nail in the coffin of the East versus and West and treat everybody equity, equitably, redistrict our schools, have meeting with real estate agents because they're really the ones that get us in trouble when it comes to where your student's going to go, and, and move forward in the right direction for the benefit of all of us. Because my school has 11 some trailers. The West now has more trailers than they ever had because they're growing faster. So what, what's happening here is now happening over there. But we don't have to keep repeating the same thing. We have the opportunity and the time, and we will have the data to back up making a more informed decision, and I'm going to continue to advocate for that. And trust me, it's painful. Seven years is a very long time to spend a, looking at land and working with former board members and working with the BOCS and, and still be in this very same situation. I hope that we can wait on the study utilize the information that's coming out of it and really make smart decisions. And Dr. McDade, if you could re refresh our memory a little bit about what that study entails, that would be fantastic. Capacity study. Yeah, sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, and I just wanna go back to, you know, earlier, um, you know, 
the, the high school was slated to come online in 2026. And we went to the board and had conversations regarding, you know, uh, pausing. And at that time, it was still 2557. And we paused to um, not, not plop down the prototype, but go into a full redesign. And then September 30 hit. And we had, uh, we had seen something we hadn't seen in many, many years with uh, our enrollment dropping. And Dr. Cartledge and his team, as many of you have uh, stated tonight, is very efficient does a wonderful job at projections. And for the first time in years, they were outside the margin of error, which is a 1% uh, margin of error. So, you know, we had to pump the brakes and say, hey, what's going on here? Um, and we leaned on several other organizations out there. Uh, the Weldon Cooper Center um, at UVA uh, uh, projects enrollment, project, or enrollment for all divisions in Virginia. And their projections were in line with what we were seeing. In fact, the Weldon Cooper Center actually uh, projected us to lose more students over the next five or six years than what our model's projecting. Uh, Dr. Cartledge and his team also consult with two of the leading demography uh, organizations um, in the nation, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and their um, interpretation was the same. Uh, so we leaned on several data sources to uh, really capture uh, what we were seeing with declining enrollment. And again, this is the first time, it's a phenomenon for the first time that we've seen in Northern Virginia since 1970. So, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, we took a look at, at, at high school projections. And so, you know, looking at 2030, 2031, um, if we were to, um, with the 14th high school coming on in 2029, we potentially have 800 vacant seats in the high schools in the community where that's going to be impacted, and so uh, you know, being fidu you know, being uh, fiscal stewards, we thought let's pump the brakes, uh, let's let's gather some more information. We thought it would be responsible to take more time to study the enrollment, to see if the enrollment projections were going to play out as as if everybody else is projecting. Gives us a little more time to study that. Gives us a little more time also to. Uh, engaging conversations around many different topics that folks had mentioned tonight, like transfer rates, any specialty programming at the 14th High School. And again, um, we have not said that we're not building the 14th High School. We're moving forward as if the 14th High School is coming on in 2029 uh, with a capacity of about 1,400 students. And I want to be very, very clear, when we design that building, the design will be intentional so that we can expand onto that building. So when we engage with the architect, it will be uh, with the expectation that that's a, a, a building that we can easily expand onto uh, should we see enrollment begin to, um, you know, increase. So that's the goal here. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are with our enrollment projections. So I just want to be clear, it was, it was a... It, it was leveraging a lot of different data points and making that decision. I do, but I do want, thank you for that, Vern, but I do want to make sure that everyone's clear what the capacity study will entail. So maybe I'm if sorry. we could have, yeah. um, no, 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 that's, that was good information, but I do want um, Matt to share like what, what that will entail. Thank you, Dr. McDade. So this year we have committed to updating the capacity metric at the high school level to mirror program capacity that has been rolled out first at elementary and then at the middle school level. When we use planning capacity at the elementary level, we soon realized that as a product primarily of the K-3 class size reduction grant, the metric was not capturing the true space of these elementary schools. For example, if we were assuming 24 students per classroom at the elementary level, and the school appeared to be at 80% of capacity, but there were 10 trailers present, something didn't make sense. And with the reduction for grades K through three, the grant could allow those class sizes to be reduced significantly from 24, you know, down to 15, 14 students per classroom. So that was the primary motivator for shifting from a planning capacity to program capacity at the elementary level. It also captures those nuances like gifted, ELS programs, all those other variety of programs that can reduce a school's capacity when the class sizes are reduced. When we moved forward and rolled out the middle school program capacity, we noticed that division-wide, 
there was a difference of about 180 seats between planning capacity at the middle school level versus program capacity at the middle school level. You pick up space in a middle school from the gymnasium as being one of the core classrooms that serves a class throughout the whole day. In turn, you lose a classroom for the health course that's there periodically throughout the term. What that suggests to us initially is that at the middle school level, when you don't have a class size reduction grant lowering class sizes, there's still utility in having program capacity and at the same time, the impact or the magnitude that we might expect at the high school level might be more similar to what we saw at the middle school level than what we saw back when we shifted from planning to program at the elementary level. Nevertheless, our team is committed to updating the regulation that outlines program capacity, and it's our intent to have this rolled out for high schools by the end of this calendar year. Okay, Ms. Wall. Thank you, that was interesting, and I had forgotten that uh, the, the piece about the elementary school programming capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was good, good to hear that. Um, some of the arguments that I've heard for putting this, uh, since that's the motion that's before us, putting the 14th back on schedule from previous CIPs, proposed CIPs, is um, the methodology of the data, which we talked about a little bit. And I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to add to that. Um, at this time, but I had a couple of other things, top arguments that I wanted to address. Is there anything you The only thing I do want to add, um, Dr. Cartledge, to just, when you, when um, Mr. Bach talked about the Weldon Cooper study, which was only one study, and actually that study was after our team had already done all of the data analysis. And when that study came out, it just really reaffirmed what they had already saw. That study is a little bit more aggressive, but we believe that our data is even more accurate because uh, Dr. Cartledge and his team has had an opportunity to change the methodology and use data from um, PWCS even resources that gives us more accuracy. So I do want you to just give some visibility into uh, some of the ways that you capture um, data to project enrollment. Yes, thank you, Dr. McDade. So first of all, one of the key enhancements this year is partnering with the Virginia Department of Health and using address level data to identify where past live births occurred and then correlating that with the attendance area to which they're assigned today. As Dr. McDade mentioned, the Weldon Cooper projections that came out months after we projected and in effect validated what we were anticipating. That was kind of the third validation. The first one was with the Lapkoff and Gobelet demographic research firm based out of California. And then the other one was with statistical forecasting. This is the firm that the prior board used to audit PWCS's projection methods back in about 2019. So at working with those two independent firms on the redesign of our model assisted in our confidence in moving forward the statistical forecasting firm, in fact, projected some of our schools so that we could compare our model's projections to what that firm would have projected using all the most current data and the gold standard for projection methods at the K-12 level. Thank you, Dr. Cartledge. Thank you. That's very interesting. And I think it's important to note that we, wow, am I too close? <laughs> that um, we were using our own methodologies that had been new and improved from 2019 and the things that we learned, right? And that we also had been pulling in statistical data from, you said, the Virginia Department of Health. And I remember we had that conversation because it explained some of the things that are happening in my district, schools that are very under capacity, um, next to schools that are very overcrowded because we were able to narrow down, you know, zoom in on the zip code data. Um, and like the opening of innovation and how we kind of underestimated or we overestimated how many kindergarten classes we were going to need, for instance, and that has implications. It was small, but then we had to move people, et cetera. Um, so I appreciate that a lot. And I think it's important that we understand, you know, 
we do the best we can with the data that we have, and we have a lot of good folks working on data science for us. Um, my other thing that I've heard a little bit about, and people have come in and talked about, and I'd like to know a little bit more about, is this um, is situation of like rovers um, versus trailers at a school. Um, you know, Battlefield High School, for instance, is at the same percentage capacity as Woodbridge High School right now, currently. Um, Battlefield has experienced a precipitous drop in capacity. It used to be at 150% maybe five years ago. Now it's at 103. Those two schools are at 103. Um, but Battlefield has a lot of trailers and Woodbridge does not. And so if, I wondered if you could speak to um, the, some of the ways that the division offers schools to deal with the ebb and flow of a few more students. Because as I'm reading the data here, um, Woodbridge High School in the 2023-24 year has an excess, or sorry, has a deficit of 110 seats. But then by just the school year 2025-26 school year, the projection is a deficit of only 20 seats. And then by the 26-27 school year, it would have a surplus of available seats of 64. So this is, this is a little bit of an accordion going on at Woodbridge right now. Um, and yet the school, as I can tell from our data, doesn't have any trailers. So would somebody like to speak to maybe why that is, and sure. maybe give the public an answer or some sure. light enlightenment on that? Ms. Wall, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that. And uh, Dr. Cartledge and his team really lead an effort every year that uh, really takes a look at enrollment at all of our schools, uh, really starts uh, fairly early in the year after the year starts. Uh, looking at you know where the September 30th enrollment comes in, and then what are the needs to supplement space at schools? And and uh, uh, you know one of the ways we supplement is through portable classrooms. Uh, we go out on site, we send teams out on site, meet with the principal, uh, walk the space, review the space, uh, look at uh, options for how we might be able to address the overcrowding. And one of those solutions sometimes is portable classrooms. Um, to date, Woodbridge High School is not elected to. Uh, utilize portable classrooms to help mitigate any overcrowding that they might have. And is that a school-based decision? Um, up to now, it's been a school-based decision. Uh, Dr. Cartledge and I have, have worked pretty closely with leaders, and, and so we'll be taking a little bit of a different approach moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we always want the input of uh, our school leaders and what we're doing to impact their school environment, uh, but it'll be uh, a collaborative decision. So the comments we've heard about 19 classes on rovers, that, that was a school-based decision? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and then um, the last question I had, I think was perhaps addressed by Ms. Williams a little bit, but um, just this idea of um, having student, we show student population decreasing, yet others say that it's going up, you know, just kind of this like declining and rising population. And I know, I think we addressed that. I think we probably addressed that. Um, but just those population estimates in general for our region, I know I've seen news articles on this that don't even relate to PWCS, but they just relate to the Northern Virginia area in general. This is a phenomenon that we have not experienced in the Northern Virginia area in the last, well, since the 70s, right? Um, is there anything you want to add to that? Because obviously it is going to affect, it does affect us. It's a new mindset that we have to get our heads wrapped around that we're not rapidly growing like we were in the early 2000s. Yep. Dr. Cartlidge, can you recap um, some of the reasons why we're seeing some of the enrollment uh, projection decreases that we're seeing, and that, which has already actually started this year? Yeah, so kind of at a, a larger scale, thinking about population beyond K-12, we're seeing increases in domestic net out-migration from Northern Virginia of populations choosing to move further out from the D.C. city center, so the exurbs of Fauquier County, Stafford. They're also moving farther south to the greater Richmond area and even farther south to the Carolinas and Georgia. And in some of our speaking engagements, we've learned just from anecdotal pieces of evidence that variety of families that leaders knew, you know, in fact, did relocate to Georgia. So we're kind of seeing some anecdotal evidence validating what we're seeing through U.S. Census Bureau data, suggesting that there are increases in population moving away from the region. 
We also look at the international migration to our region. That's another component that can influence population here. And the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, they've published recently um, validating that yes, domestic net out migration for Northern Virginia and Prince William County specifically, we are seeing more people leave domestically. We're seeing a little bit of an uptick in international migration but the study cites that because there were several travel restrictions that have since been lifted, that's kind of a pent up demand that is coming through in the most recent data that's available from the Census Bureau. Um, in addition to that, we have decreasing birth rates. That's a nationwide trend. And given the data that we received from the Virginia Department of Health, Prince William County is not immune to that trend. We are seeing decreases overall in the most recent data that then become our kindergartners five, six, seven years into the future. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's clear to see that what we're observing with our own data is being validated by many other data points. And as I look at the data from this chart, which is the current and projected capacity utilization amendment assessment, and I can stop actually, Dr. Dr. Lateef, and pick it up at a different time, but okay. go ahead, we'll wrap this All up. Right. So, um, you know, as I look at this, even if we were to build the 14th school, the 14th high school in 2029 as proposed, um, and at a reduced ca seat capacity of 1400, even if we were to do that, we would still have 459 seats available division wide at the high school level. That's delayed with a reduced capacity. Now if we proceed, the way I'm looking at this data, if we proceed to add this back in as the motion um, put forward by Akagwan District Representative, if we proceed to add this back in in 2027 without adjusting the seat capacity, when it would open with over, th we would open it with over 3,000 surplus bases for students. Am I correct in how I'm reading the data? We'd have an over 3,000 surplus. I'd like to kind of just summarize what you're seeing there in the data. If we moved forward with a 2557 capacity 14th high school, by 2030, our furthest out projection year, we would have a projected 2,856 seats vacant throughout all 14 high schools in the division. That equates to the largest school in our current institution. So there'd be more seats empty than we have seats at Garfield. Okay, wow. If we reduce the capacity to 1,400, then in that 2030 year across the whole division, we would have just under 1,700 vacant seats projected. If we build nothing, and we're not suggesting that, we're at this point the data is supporting a delay, but I'm just saying if nothing were built in 2030, the projections suggest about 300 seats vacant throughout the whole division at the high school level. So uh, redistricting, in theory, if these projections come true, you could effectively balance enrollment across the whole district. Okay, that, that's really interesting. And, and something to think about. And I understand it's not being taken out of the CPA, CIP. It's being pro proposed for a two-year two year delay to assess and, pro and build a new plan and assess specialty program and everything else. But even if we were to remove it and we redistricted everybody, we'd still have an, a surplus of 300-something seats. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Zarga. I'm gonna I just wanted to ask a quick question on, on top of that real quick, sorry. Okay. When, when, you, when you do that projection, because we're talking a lot about development and growth and things that are incoming, I think I asked this before, but do those numbers include, and let me be clear, voted on development, because I am also speaking about things that have not gone all the way through yet, which I understand, but in the past, we, we didn't plan, and we ended up, with an issue at Battlefield and, Patri and Patriot and over there on that side for those years, because I was here for that, alive and paying attention. Um, so I'm just asking you out loud, does that include 
be voted on projects incoming. So in the projections, we are projecting a snapshot in time in the future. Each projection year is September 30th of that school year. Therefore, our baseline for projecting is our current September 30th point in time. The developments that had rezoning approval at that point in time are built into the projection models. Anything that has since gained rezoning approval will be picked up in the projections that we project this coming September. So in the spirit of the CIP, we're an agile process. We, we respond to things that come to fruition. Um, let me have Ms. Zargapur because she hasn't commented yet and the rules are such that we'll have and then we'll go back to questions. Ms. Zargapur. So um, as the representative of Colgan, who it, that is very overcrowded, we have rovers at, Cro at, at Colgan um, and we have trailers. And um, we had them when my, uh, my daughter's now graduated, but she, she went in as a freshman with, with, with those experiences. So um, it's, been, it's been a while there too. Um, Meanwhile, Hilton, which is just a couple miles down the road, is under-enrolled. And um, we, we've heard people talk about different kinds of facilities that we may want to consider. I'm not against building something. I think it's well worth the time to wait and see what we learn in our reports and see what it is that we, our community actually needs. Uh, there's potential. I, you know, I work for Fairfax County Public Schools. We have secondary schools. Um, Mr. Denick said she went to, um, you went to basically middle high school, right? at one point, right? So there's a lot of things we can consider about how we do whatever we're gonna do. And I am um, of the mindset that it, I think if we take in the information, uh, we can make a better decision that way. So I'm not against building something. I just want to make sure that something really suits the needs of our, of our school division and our students. So uh, Ms. Williams and then Mr. Jesse and then Mr. Wilk. Oh, I guess, Mr. Blake, you haven't talked on this issue, have you? Okay, Mr. Blake. I, don't, I mean, I just think that we have to be uh, good, good uh, fiscal stewards. And I think that going with uh, Mr. Bach and Dr. McDay's recommendation is the right thing to do. I mean, in, just in my district, even though Hilton is not uh, in my district, it's still a Dale City school and both of my schools are under enrolled, if I would say both of my Dale City schools. So I think that taking time to study and see, like everybody up here has mentioned, shifting the lines and sending kids to schools, might, we might alleviate. I'm not against not building this high school. I'm not very happy at the, the spot where you wanna build it, but um, I think that we should definitely delay and get all the right information so that we can make the right decision. So $300 million is a lot of money to spend, you know, and not do the right thing. So that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Ms. Williams, and then Mr. Jesse, then Mr. Wilk. Thank you. I just want to, for the sake of clarity, do we have already, uh, and I believe the answer to this is no, um, but do we have already uh, a footprint for the smaller scale school? or do we only have the footprint for the larger? Yeah, yes ma'am, we have a footprint for the larger high school, or, which has been our prototype. So uh, to, uh, we would have to do a full engagement, a full redesign effort to design a building at 1400. And so we do not have that at this point. Okay, so that's also part of what extends out the process. Yes ma'am. Should the board decide on budget uh, approval night that we, whatever, um, just theoretically change our mind, we do the 25, it would condense the amount of time to actually build the school because we already have the plan, correct? Yes, ma'am, it would. Okay, and then, um, but that is part of the, the discussion and debate the board has to do, and that's why we pause. And then um, what I'm concerned about it, that I hear in this discussion and I think is brought up every year is we, we have to sort of figure out some better methodology or some sort of backup plan for lack of a better way to, to term it in the sense that we only operate off of what is approved 
but we don't have a contingency plan for if a development goes offline, if a development that was approved 20 years ago suddenly comes online during the middle, what do we do with these students? What do we do with the staff? What do we, how do we handle that? We, we don't ever talk about that. And I, th to me, that's one of the most uh, challenging things. I'm not saying that you're going to magically come up with a solution. I don't expect you to have one because we've not asked that question. And that's really, I think, the heart of what's going on. What do we do in the meantime? I heard you say a minute ago that you were reconsidering um, the site-based decision on whether or not to have trailers, um, which I think is a very important discussion that we've, we have not had before because it, it does create inequities. The, the real question right now is not just at Woodbridge, but at Freedom, at Colgan, what do we do in the meantime? We know it takes a long time to build a school. Um, some people love trailers, some people don't, but I think it might uh, behoove this board and the administration if we started having those discussions on what could we do? What are the options? We've not really explored them. We've always band-aid. We've always piecemealed. Um, and if we could at a later date really sort of um, entertain those type of ideas and how, what are the other options out there? Can't just be trailers. Maybe it is. I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe it's temporarily moving students. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying we haven't done that. Maybe it's time to consider that in the future for when we have these issues. Because, uh, again, 3,000 students, 1990. Hilton opened 1991. We lost a bunch of programs. Some of them never came back. Some of them just came back now. We, we don't have a, a plan for that. So I think it might be smart as we move down the line to start having those conversations. Uh, because when we sit and we talk about, you look at the student generation rate, that snapshot is only for what we know right now. If 17 new developments come online throughout the county, those numbers are no longer accurate. It's true. So it's helpful that our CIP and our budget is a living document. My school was, elementary school was slated to open one year, then it got pushed back, then it got moved forward. So I think we also need to be mindful of that. There are all changes that we could make as we move on next year, maybe pushing the high school up sooner. Maybe it's a discussion of another building. Um, but I think we, we owe it to the public out there to also entertain what do we do in the interim. So I don't know where Barbara went, but thank you, Ms. Vice Chair. Uh, Mr. Jesse. The, uh, <clears throat> the one thing I want to, want to say is that uh, when I said that the last board approved something. <clears throat> and when you say pump the brakes, I understand what you're saying. What I'm saying I want to make very clear is that when the brakes are pumped on something that has been approved that is of significance, and when you talk about schools at $300,000, a million dollars, and renovations that are very expensive, the board should have a, a special meeting to decide whether the brakes should be pumped because what happened, if I understand it correctly, is that uh, the plans were going forward on the 14th high school and the brakes were pumped, correct? Well, when I, when I referred to the brakes being pumped, that was with engagement with the board. Well, the engagement with the board by two and, and your two and two meetings is not a, is you overrode a decision from the previous board okay and you can look at dr mcdade or i think but uh, you so did I, I overrule a, yeah let, let's have dr mcdade answer that mr jess that's actually i mean it's really for the board to respond to because we don't have the authority to overrule the board there's nothing that i can do or anyone on this staff can do without permission from the board. So we don't have that authority. So, I mean, I, I don't think that that's a question for us. I, I think I would defer that to uh, the school board because there's never been a time in my administration that I have done anything without um, going seek, first seeking the board's um, support. So that's a question for the full board to address. And I, I'll leave it alone after this. What you just said, is that you never do anything without going to the board. Going to the board on two and two meetings and so, and so forth. Something as significant as these delays 
should have been, in my opinion, brought back to the entire board in a meeting and voted on. And it was not, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, just the, a clarification, Mr. Jesse, this is what we're doing today. So if the board no, so chose, no. if the board so chose to vote to proceed and not have the delay, that can be done tonight. So that we are doing that, and the pro no, this is a proposed no. budget, a proposed CIP. This is proposed. The superintendent explained the development of the proposal to the board, but this is the vote. This is what we're talking about tonight. And Dr. Madej, I, you know, I fully understand that, but you're missing the point. When the project was delayed before this vote, and I have no problems within the middle of the year that we say we need to stop and we need to pump the brakes, but on a project that has been approved by the previous board, you stopped it and the board did not give an official approval. Now, the problem with that is that this is the eighth delay. The community is getting to the point where we don't trust you. We don't trust the board because every time we look around, this high school got pushed back. The first time, the first two or three times, it was because the location over on the other side of near Holy Road and so forth, the community didn't want it. So two or three times it was delayed. But now it's delayed. We have no confidence in our board that we're not going to delay it again. And in the meantime, Woodbridge High School is needing relief. They say Garfield High School doesn't need it, but we do, okay? And uh, so, that, so that's, that's just my point. And you agree with it I, I, or not, that's, but I just want to make that. The other thing is when we look, Mrs. Jesse fought for years to get rid of the trailers in Occoquan District. And we got rid of almost every trailer except for maybe one or two. And they're coming back. And they're coming back in strong thing. And it's just sickening that we have a, a school that we added an addition on within the last five, 10 years. And now we have a trailer out in front of that school and my understanding from talking to some of my principals, probably every, it looks like almost all our schools are gonna have, elementary schools are gonna have trailers. So the other question is, if all our elementary schools are getting over capacity, where in the heck are they gonna go when they go to high school? It, it, it doesn't, this, this, this doesn't seem to make sense to me, okay? The other thing I would like to say is stop. If you're going to delay Woodbridge, you're going to delay, delay everybody until this is done. Uh, you know, adding on to elementary schools right now, you're saying elementary schools are getting lower. So why are we going to add on to them? It just doesn't make sense. And let's see. I think that's all. Thank you. Mr. Wilk. Okay, well, <laughs> I was worried. I thought this was going to be initially what I was going to say, but that's okay, because at first I was worried this wasn't going to be germane anymore, but now it has become. Uh, so first of all, I want to acknowledge that I understand in some sense, although we're not talking apples to apples, but, you know, if any of you recall that when we were at work sessions, um, you know, my belief and my constituents' belief was that Grand Park at the time was dilapidated, and it was up for renovations. And every year despite knowing that I was going to lose, I did put it up for a motion to move it up an additional year, and respectfully, it died 1-7, one, 1-7, seven, one, seven. ooh, if I was Kitty Britt, 1-7, one, 1-7, seven. One, seven. One, seven, one, seven, one, seven. And so, my point is, I get the frustration, but I also understand afterwards, you know, I was reticent because I knew I was doing what I needed to do for my community. And I made that attempt at the work session. It failed, I had to move on. Now I do wanna highlight because it was just mentioned that we need to pause potentially across the board. 
um, and, and I just want to talk about where the CIP the proposal currently stands um, because of the modular classroom situation in the Potomac District. Um, it's no secret, I have the fastest growing community in the entire east side of the county, um, and that is Potomac Shores. Um, and my community right now, that elementary school, we were talking about you know, schools being young, five, six, seven years old. Uh, I have three, I'm sorry, five modular classes right out front with a projection of 150 to 300 more students coming next year, leading to a total of eight modular classes. Now, there continues being discussing about the future housing units and what is coming, the projections. Let me tell you this. So currently right now, and I talked to the head developer there, there are 2,152 residential units in Potomac Shores. Right now, right now if we opened up an elementary school back there, it would fill a traditional size. We are anticipating by the time this is done, 3,987 residential places, whether it be uh, single family homes, single family townhomes, condos, luxury villas, whatever. But we are looking at just under 4,000 students. So this proposed CIP, which has this moving up here, which has always been the plan, does free and alleviate space over 250 to 300 million for projects like this in areas that need it. It also frees up additional funding for other things like renovations. I think Grand Park could get some additional support. I mean, heck, in a dream scenario, and like we all might have these dream scenarios, I'd love money to go to Dumfries Elementary for renovations, but that's not where we're at, right? So we can't pause right now. The stark contrast of what we're talking about here, you can see it going down Riverview Drive and Potomac Shores. There is nowhere for people to go. It's bustling, it's overcrowded. Now, quickly touching on the high schools, everyone has thrown out there about their high schools, their statement. Forest Park is at 112% capacity, right? It's overcrowded. It has three trailers to help alleviate the overcrowding. On the other end, I have a high school that is under capacity, and for the foreseeable future, that building is going to be under capacity, which in effect could impact things like equity pro, not equity programs, specialty programs in other different areas that, you know, if we had a full building, we could maybe do uh, different course offerings and such. So I see the situation, you know, to follow the proposals and look at potentially putting um, additions onto our existing buildings where it's needed most. And as I think has been kind of uh, reiterated here by multiple board members, look at these glaring boundary issues to fill the number of buildings that are under capacity right now um, at this time. So that is my piece. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wall, if this is your last time. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I um, wanted to address something a little bit, um, just kind of bigger picture about schools and construction and students, um, the, the driver of a new school is need. It's not that it was in a document or that it was promised or anything else. School construction follows students. Enough students equal a new school. And obviously you can't build a new school if you have all the neighboring schools at approximately 100% capacity. You have to have a, a large enough surplus in order to justify the building and filling of a new school or else you, you potentially decimate the neighboring schools because there will be an outflux of students from the schools and then you run into problems where you have to cancel programs and classes and can't get enough kids to be on the girls basketball team because you just don't have enough students to field all of the opportunities that students ought to have and that have that they have at other high schools. So I think we need to keep in mind that yes, if you have housing developments and you have an, an, a, an increase in students, then you, then you justify a new school, but you don't justify it just because it's somebody's turn or it was promised in the past. And things do change as we've seen in our region. 
um, you know, even with something as simple as teleworking coming online and becoming so much more prevalent, people are not commuting, and so they're not living in, in expensive jurisdictions like Arlington and Alexandria. They're leaving, and they're going to Culpeper and somewhere else because they can work in their sweats from their basement. So I, I think these things affect us, and we need to keep in mind what drives school construction. It's need. Um, and yes, any school that is overcrowded has a need. I personally experienced this with all of my high schoolers at Battlefield. Now we have the reverse problem at Battlefield where we're seeing a precipitous um, decline in student enrollment and it will have its own set of problems because uh, Gainesville wasn't right sized. Gainesville was built too big and we've now experienced all these demographics that we heard about where we're having this aha moment of like, oh, we're not growing leaps and bounds like we were in the past. So I think we really do need to be wise. And Ms. Dargapur was very modest in her approach to Colgan, but that's where our real overcrowding is. And I want to emphasize that again, according to our data, Colgan is at 142% capacity with 10 trailers. Freedom, OP, and Forest Park are all at about 112% capacity from our latest data. Freedom has 11, Osborne Park has seven. I had zero for Forest Park. I didn't know if they had three or zero. But in any event, the next tier down is Woodbridge and Battlefield at about 103, 104. And then all the rest of our high schools, all seven remaining high schools are under capacity. And this is something that we really need to address. We, we have a, a right sizing problem and others have mentioned it. Redistricting is not popular. I know people don't like it, but that's what our real problem is. Now, as for the issue of um, whether the division has done something improper by proposing that this 14th high school be delayed two years, my opinion is it has not done anything improper. The division works for us and has done their due diligence in assessing the data and has made a proposal to us. And the proposal comes forward as a proposed CIP. And we, as the decision makers, evaluate, as Dr. Latif said, we evaluate the proposed CIP and then we make the vote depending on whether we accept the recommendations that have given, been given to us based on the data that we have and our trust in our division employees and our superintendent or whether we think we know something different or something better. So I think, um, I, I disagree. Uh, I think the process has been straightforward. There's been integrity in the process. And just because we've been made aware of proposals through a two by two does not mean that our power to make the decision has been taken away from us. Because we sit here tonight having this work session, our second one, um, and that's what we're doing now is taking in the feedback and, and evaluating all of the evidence before us in order to make a wise decision. Okay, um, so i reserve my comments for last. I, I will not be supporting Mr. Jesse's motion and I'll tell you why. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, to add on to what Ms. Wall said, um, the process um, as Dr. McDade and the, um, her office and her administration receives data, they uh, analyze the data and they share the data with the board and they do it through numerous mechanisms. And the decision to, um, after the analysis to make a recommendation for the CIP or for the budget for that matter, for the big budget, which is about 1.8 some billion dollars, um, is a proposal. It's called the superintendent's proposed budget. And all the power to approve the budget is vested in the full authority of this board at all times. And so she makes her recommendations, she communicates the recommendations in many different methods, and the board has been made aware of this proposal and all that went into making the proposal of delaying it. We had a, a one hour specifically in the last CIP work session just dedicated to the enrollment trends and the concerns and all of that that went into it. So this hasn't come lightly. Um, I, I think it's important to know that the superintendent's office and, and the administration is well aware of um, the concerns of the community. 
I have heard the folks in the community. I understand their disappointment and concerns about overcrowding. Um, as chairman at large, I have to deal with overcrowding across the county and undercrowding. I have a school at Hilton, which is way under capacity, that might get dropped from the Virginia High School League's Division VI to a lower division. This is a historic, you know, competitive championship high school that has a really remarkable tradition that um, has been cannibalized by the way the lines were drawn when Colgan went into effect. And so that is an issue. We have some under capacity and we have some issues that, that have to be dealt with there. And you've heard a lot about that tonight. So as chairman at large for me, my responsibilities are to the entire community and it's not bounded by any boundaries and it is for the best of this division. And so moving forward, I do um, you know, um, support the superintendent's proposal on this. I think it's also important to know that Woodbridge is a great high school. It's a fantastic place. There's a reason why there's a lot of folks there. There's a reason why folks don't choose to go to other schools that might have programs that attract them. There is capacity, for example, the Sizzle program at Hilton or the IB program at Garfield, but folks love Woodbridge. It's also a historic, wonderful high school. I don't get any emails about students being unhappy and parents being typically unhappy with the school. Is it overcrowded? Yes, and I've seen those emails recently, of course. It's always been a little bit overcrowded. But you know, at a lot of our schools that are overcrowded, folks are happy to be there. And so I'm not saying that that's why I'm voting on this. I do recognize we need to reduce the overcrowding. I recognize we need to do that. And that's something that, you know, we've built many schools. Um, I think it's 27 or 28 schools um, this century alone, um, maybe more than that. Um, probably the most schools in any division this size in the nation this fast. Um, and so we have tried to keep up, but the enrollment numbers are concerning. You know, the last thing I want to do is be closing schools. And so, you know, we, we don't want to have to deal with that, but we, we have to be thoughtful and methodical about this. So if we do move to a 1500, 1400 model, that in and of itself puts a delay in it. And so the board has been made aware of that for the last three months. And tonight is the night we're gonna uh, make that vote. So at this point, I'll call for the vote. So all in favor of supporting Mr. Jesse's motion, say aye. What, we don't have to remake the motion. It has been seconded. Okay, and the Mr. Jesse's motion is, um, Mr. Jesse's motion is to, um, he moved that we do not delay the 14th high school. So all in favor of Mr. Jesse's motion to not delay the high school, say aye, or raise your hand. Okay, let the record show Mr. Jesse votes aye. Okay, all opposed? And that leaves seven votes. All other members vote no. Motion fails. We're moving on to, does anyone else have any proposed changes to the budget that they'd like to make a motion for? As seeing none, we will now move to the next part of the meeting and that is, so, so th this, you know, marks the end of the work session and, um, uh, Dr. Lutz, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I think you had one hand up for, um, some, question yeah, sure I'm sorry so again I I am new here so I have not done a budget session with you all before I I had questions and I now I know for next year I will send them ahead of time I do think that these are important questions that people in my district have asked in the past and I just wanted them answered on the record and I think that if I can quickly ask these at a high level to explain some things I think that's going to be helpful um, so sorry, I know we sat here for an hour discussing, but um, that's, yeah, Justin. What's the increase of 48% to the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, part of the budget? It's a $817,000 increase. Can you just explain, because I know we've had a conversation and you explained to me what some of those programs were, and I wanted to be able to ask that. 
All right, um, one, I, I wanna acknowledge that we did hear public comment on this. So we um, pulled out the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, budget. And I think it's important to note that the diversity, equity, and inclusion office, while it addresses systematically um, equity and access across the board, it houses also multiple um, you know, federally required compliance uh, pieces of the division. For example, in the DEI office, it also houses Title IX, as well as Title VI, and the investigative process that goes with both of those. Um, and can, so, you, can you just quickly say so, what Title so, IX, Title VI is? Uh, sexual harassment, discrimination, um, harassment overall, and um, does that cover it, Wade? Yes, ma'am, it covers <laughs> any allegations of discrimination based on uh, sexual harassment or sex, which is Title IX, and of course, race, Title VI, mm -hmm. um, and there are investigators uh, in that office who are tasked with investigating those complaints and rendering judgments in accordance with our Title IX and Title VI responsibilities. So that, so it's just important to note that that's all housed in that office, and so all of the, that the personnel expenses that go with um, uh, both Title VI and Title IX are also housed in the DEI office. Additionally, anything that we do by way of programming that supports um, ensuring that students across this system have equitable access to programming, for example, in this is, is found in their budget. So for example, um, in this office, we uh, support paying for SA SAT uh, tutoring um, during and after school. Um, budgeting to make sure students uh, can take the SAT without having to pay for it, that's all found in the DEI budget. So we increase funding to support in-person SAT prep for high school juniors to the tune of $256,000. That's an off-cycle investment in the DEI office. So students who are um, taking the SAT, this includes both the teacher time for preparing students and access to the SAT materials. That's in the DEI office. Um, we've increased funding to support um, the, the staff members in the high school who are, we have equity teams that get supplemental pay in the high school and those t money is used for high dosage tutoring before and after school for AP, IB, Cambridge and dual enrollment courses. That was to the tune of about $65,000. We also increase funding to support compliance investigator training to make sure that all of our uh, investigators for Title IX and Title VI are getting appropriate training and refreshing on the training. So we had an off cycle investment there. And then w for our equal opportunity schools, which the board, we presented to the board on that, where students um, across all demographics who are not currently taking AP, IB, or Cambridge courses, but in, would for all intents and purposes qualify to take those courses. We put in um, supports to inform their parents, target, um, do student, student surveys and target support so that we can increase access to advanced coursework for students who traditionally have been underrepresented in those courses. Uh, before we were paying for that, um, we had to pick up the cost for paying for EOS in the DEI office. So that, that's all the types of programming that you'll see there. And then the last thing I would say is that uh, that's a part of the increase that you just uh, mentioned. Our family and, and com community engagement, we moved it from the Office of Multilingual Services and Supports into DEI. And so because their job is to ensure that all families are, are being engaged, so we've increased funding to support our family and, and community engagement series. That's the educational series that we offer monthly to all of our families, which also requires translation services, which are extremely expensive. And so we've increased funding to cover translation services. For example, um, just for Cambodian translation, it was like $7,000. Um, that's all in the DEI office. And then any salary increases for, for all of those positions that I just talked about in the compliance, um, salary increases, there, you, that shows up in the budget. And that's across the board. Sometimes we, you may see a, 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 a department's budget increase and they've really not added any new programming, but when we have staffing increases in um, a 3%, the 2% increase we got in January, the 6% increase, all of that makes the cost for personnel increase and it shows up in that department's budget. So that's what you're seeing in the DEI office. Um, it's, it's all of the work that we're doing in the actual strategic plan, but I think the one thing that was really important to note 
is that I don't think that people realize that in the DE office, we also house Title IX and Title VI, and we're funding that um, there. Thank you. Um, the multi-tiered system of supports doubled for both budget cycles. Um, I just noticed that it was 108% increase. Can you ex explain that a little bit, what, what went into that? That's in um, Dr. Fulinard's shop, so she probably would be better poised to give some details. Thank you, Dr. McDade, and good evening. Uh, thank you for your question. And actually what we did was an analysis of the Title VI B grant, which is a special education grant, and the tenants of that grant are actually better utilized. And so we reorganized the uh, individuals that were being funded from Title VI B to MTSS, so it's actually a net zero, uh, although it does appear to be an increase. It's really just a shifting of funds. And can you just, what is MTSS for? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Multi-tiered system of support. So that is really looking at providing a systematic way for our students that have gaps and um, have need for potential remediation and or intervention, and then providing targeted support and instructional practices to identify and fill those gaps. Awesome, thank you. Um, See, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a mathematician, but I can see where there's increases and decreases, so that's what I was looking at. This um, summer school, I noticed, went down by 40%, which, you know, I like savings, but I'm also wondering, was there not as much demand, or what was... Again, that is a really good question because on the onset, it does look like there was a decrease. We didn't have a decrease in the students. What we're able to do is capitalize on the ESSER dollars to utilize those towards summer school funds, so that way we can better use our funds. Great. And then one more I noticed, it's um, also in my district, the governor's school increased um, by 65%. Is that due to enrollment or? Um... It's a combination of stuff. Um, in the 24 budget, the governor's school drew down on their fund balance. They had fund balance and uh, there was, it was growing. So in lieu of us contributing the city of Manassas, and City of Manassas Park making contributions, we used fund balance. And then, yes, there is an increase in, um, in, 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 in some of the enrollment, but it's mainly due to that. And so in 2025, we had to restore our funding because there was no fund balance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Trinanic, appreciate it. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Um, just for, for clarification, Dr. McDade uh, or, or Shaquille, um, if we do get extra monies on the state budget, if that gets approved, are those baseline increases or are they one-time dollars? Does anyone know? That's a good question. <laughs> Depending on the, the nature, so there's compensation supplements and uh, the, the grocery tax, you could consider those baseline adjustments. One of the things I alluded to earlier on was that without the VDOE calculation templates, yeah. we really can't determine what, uh, what our match is supposed to be. But uh, I would say the majority of that would, would help with our baseline. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, that, that's great to know because if we, if we do come back and we have to look at some of the... Um, other things that support the strategic plan, we'll have an idea of what we can use that money for, especially if it's uh, baseline adjusted. That's always better than the one time. Okay, wonderful. Okay, at this point now, uh, there being no further other um, questions, concerns, Ms. Arkport, you have your hand on the button. You're good, okay. Okay, um, oh, we need a motion. So at this point, we, we call for a vote to typically accept the budget as presented or with changes, we, there hasn't been any changes as presented. And then, like I said, you'll go to the board meeting, we'll hear the budget, we'll have a presentation at the meeting again. You're not bound by today's vote if you're supporting the budget, you can certainly change there. Um, but typically, this is where we have the final questions. If anything changes in the next week, you certainly have time to ask questions to the staff, ask clarifications, there's still more time for questions and discussion at the next meeting. Ms. Argaport, please make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Prince William County School Board accept the fiscal year 2025 budget as presented in this evening's work session and final markup. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. Second. Any discussion? 
Okay. All those in favor of um, the motion? Well, it, this is a straw. I mean, this is a straw. It's not, not binding, right? So that's what I said earlier. So, okay, all in favor? Up, aye. Hands in the air. Uh, oh, seven, yes. And opposed? And one no. Mr. Jesse. Okay. Do you have another motion? Oh, they got it, got it, got it. All right. At that point, there being no further board business between before this board, the meeting is adjourned. This is so. This is, look at that. Look at that.